to all those who devoted their lives to aviation. The Wings of Russia Studio presents Wings of Russia documentary. Mankind created a lot of machines. An airplane having mastered the laws of the air stopped being a miracle. Way before that, ships stamped the oceans. But the restless man keeps on creating new machines. And there you are, a vessel that can take off from water, not really leaving it. What is it? A sailing aircraft or a flying vessel? What kind of a technical wonder is that, existing at the edge of two environments? The Wing in Ground Effect Systems At the Edge of Two Environments At the dawn of the aviation development, pilots realized that airplanes behave differently at landing than up in the sky. As if unwilling to land, a descending airplane was like running into an air cushion. This was called the wing in ground effect, and nobody wondered why this was happening. It was simply taken into account at landing. In 1923, Boris Yuryev, a Soviet expert in aerodynamics, experimented with this effect. Sometime later, there appeared a mathematical reasoning with figures and formulas. The wing in ground effect occurs when an aircraft flies low and the distance between the wing and land is small. The incoming air reflected by the wing hits the land and returns back. Thus, an additional lifting power appears. Such effect is most complete when the flight altitude is less than the wing's width. All this seemed very attractive since it promised a lot of savings. Additional lifting power means that the payload could be bigger. On the other hand, low altitude flights always thought to be most dangerous. At that time, no research of the effect was decided to be undertaken since there were more than enough problems with ordinary airplanes. It all turned into single test and trial model. Swedish designer Troyan and Finnish engineer Ario performed some experiments in this field. While in the Soviet Union, inventor Pavel Grachowski made a model of the wing-in-ground machine. That was about all. With the start of the war, all trial works in the USSR were completely stopped. In order to withstand the enemy, a lot of common armaments needed to be produced. There were no thoughts as to where in aviation the wing-in-ground effect could be used. Real work started only in the 60s. Finally, instead of aviation, the effect found its utilization in the shipbuilding industry. On July 22, 1961, a strange-looking craft could be seen on the surface of the Gorky Reservoir near the town of Chkalov. It was not an airplane, the wings were too small. Neither it was a motorboat, since it moved too fast, slightly above the water surface. 
It was a machine based upon a wing in ground effect piloted by designer Rostislav Alexeyev. The entire history of the Russian wing in ground vessels is closely connected with the name of this man. By that time he was long working in the shipbuilding industry and was known as a talented designer. From the beginning Alexei was dissatisfied with the vessel's low speed and was trying to find a way to increase it. The solution seemed obvious. Since water produced the main reluctance to the vessel's movement, its contact with water was supposed to be minimal. The vessel was going to be taken out of water into the air, which reluctance was significantly lesser. But how to lift the vessel above water? Alexei found such a solution as hydrofoil. He did not really invented them, but having chosen them as the main method of reaching his goal, he achieved outstanding results in this course. Hundreds of tests were made in order to find the optimum combination of the hydrofoil form and its immersion. Alexei found the vessel on underwater wings was now self-stabilizing at any speed. This was the main point in which the designer succeeded over its predecessor. The underwater wing-based vessels became more fast. However, they still had a speed limit of around 140 kilometers per hour. But the need was to move faster. Alexeyev did not want to stop. He came to a conclusion that since the underwater wings were impeding the speed growth, they should be abandoned. The vessel could be kept above the surface by the wing in ground effect. That's how the wing in ground vessel was born. This machine has obvious advantages in speed as compared to a vessel and in payload as compared to an aircraft. Besides, it needs a more or less plain surface. No wonder that first experiments were conducted on water, the white glass calm surface created by nature. At Gorky Reservoir, Alexeyev established a wide range research base, including a basin, a wind tunnel, assemble workshops, repair shops, and laboratory. The first machine mentioned above was identified as SM1. For better directional stability, it had two wings, one in the front and one in the back. SM-1 was propelled by one jet engine. Works went in such a hurry that it was even not put into the engine cell. The outlook did not matter since every flight was bringing minor and major discoveries. After a series of tests, Alexeyev got confident in the machine's stability. He realized that a principally new type of transport vehicle was being born, which could be more efficient than the others. It was high time to invite military representatives. It was easier to obtain contracts with them. Soon high-ranking officials appeared. They were not only shown SM-1, but were taken for a ride. Alexei was confident in the reliability of his machine. One of the guests, Dmitry Ustinov, liked the journey at a speed of 200 kilometers per hour. In the USSR Council of Ministers, he was responsible for the military-industrial matter. The Navy commanders also liked the new machine. High speed close to that of an aircraft, ability to move not only above water, but to base on shore. Making his presentation, Alexeyev hoped to obtain support, and he was right. The wing in ground machine The next SM-2 was made with the account of the first machine. The major novelty applied was the under-wing airfield. 
with this aim, special booster engines were put in the front part. The airfeed provided for the machine's lift-off at minimal speed. The lift-off regime was the main problem of the wing and ground machine. Soon, this became the key solution in making the wing and ground machine more efficient. Such aerodynamic layout with the engines of different designations became classical for all future wing and ground machines. Alexeyev decided to show his SM-2 to Nikita Khrushchev. With this purpose, the machine was delivered to the Kimki Reservoir in Moscow. There was no time to install cruise engines, so SM-2 demonstrated its abilities only with the boosters. But even in such a capacity, Khrushchev liked the machine. He appreciated the promising military advantage over the enemies and most of all the fact that there was no such a wonder machine abroad. Khrushchev eagerly supported everything where his country would have superiority. At that time, in the West, this topic did not have the same kind of deep and wide-scale development. The task was thought to be technically super complicated. Investments could be lost with no evident result. Enthusiasts were making minor samples while Western military circles refused to risk investing into huge combat wing in ground machines. It was different in the USSR. As soon as there was hope to be ahead of the enemy, the funding of the program was found. As we see, the idea of the Russian winging ground machines could have not come true if there had not been several circumstances coming together. First of all, there was a talented, persistent to the new idea designer. Secondly, his idea coincided with the Navy's wish to obtain an innovative combat machine which analog the enemy did not possess. Finally, designers' works were enjoying support of the country leadership. Further test samples were aimed to improve the air feed system, optimize the wing size, and resolve other problems of the wing in ground machine. However, the country leadership already expected exact combat copies. It was an uneasy time. The Cold War was at its highest point. The world ocean was turned into the arena of confrontation. Everyone expected a wonder weapon from Alexeyev's design bureau. Other teams were assigned with the same task as well. Aircraft designer Roberto Bartini proposed the means of fast movement at sea. It was a non-traditional idea with the same kind of non-traditional ways of its implementation. This time Bartini offered the fantastic flying aircraft carrier, a huge platform flying above the sea from which combat aircraft could take off. The project scale was astonishing, and for the start, funds were provided only to make flying models. Bartini was given an opportunity to work on the topic at the Bidiyev Design Bureau, which specialized in hydroplanes. Models were tested in the Tsagi Hydro Channel. Soon the BE-1 wing in ground machine was made, which was called the Hydra Flyer. BE-1 made its first liftoff in 1969 with the help of the underwater wings. Thus, aircraft designers eagerly took up the wing in ground effect as well. They had as much problems as the shipbuilders had. However, Bartini did not manage to resolve them as successfully as Alexeyev did. After dozens of flights, the BE-1 topic was closed. Bartini turned to a new project, an anti-submarine vertical takeoff amphibian. It was called VVA-14. 
To call this machine unique was to say nothing. It was full of innovation. This amphibian represented a twin-fin vessel with inflatable landing gear. The cabin had an unusual outlook and was slightly extended forward. The aircraft looked wild. Twelve minor lifting engines were supposed to provide the vertical takeoff, while two cruise engines would move it. So far, the aircraft did not have the lifting engines, so tests started on shore. The first flight took place on September 4, 1972. The machine was piloted by Yuri Kupriyanov. VVA-14 looked funny in the air and was nicknamed the Fire Drake. The machine's controllability was no worse than that of ordinary airplanes. Tests showed that the wing and ground effect was even greater than it was assumed. Pilots said the aircraft simply refused to land. Then tests on water start. First of all, the machine's resistance to flooding was tested. The floats were multi-sectional, therefore the machine did not lose flotation even with the destruction of several sections. Then there were tests on taxiing with gradual speed increase. Tests went on while the lifting engines were still unavailable. The designer decided to turn the aircraft into a wing and crown machine. Bartini was inspired by Alexeyev's success. First tests were made on models, hundreds of experiments including variable regimes of speed and engines, installation angles, air feed imitation with changing intensity. Tests helped to find the optimal layout which enabled to make complete use of the wing in ground effect. VVA-14 was equipped with two engines put in the front part. To allow the takeoff run, inflatable floats were changed to metal. The name was also changed. Now the machine was called 14M1P. This Bartini's machine was unusual either. It was supposed to move as a wing in ground machine above the surface, and if needed, it could climb up and fly as an ordinary airplane. Therefore, it was called the Wing in Ground Airplane. However, this machine never managed to lift off, and in 1976, tests of this anti submarine machine were terminated. Moreover, by that time, the militaries already obtained less exotic and therefore more reliable anti-submarine means represented by aircraft of different range. Shipbuilder Rostislav Alexeyev was more successful in this work but he was not in the practical stage either. At that time, there was another method of contact-free movement over the surface. It had a much longer history, the air cushion ships. They are quite close to the winging ground machine. The latter lifts off by the incoming air. The air cushion ship is lifted over the surface with the help of special engines. Such engines pump pressurized air under the vessel which is held up by the so-called wall member. Forward movement is performed by cruise engines. First works in the USSR in this sphere go back to the 30s. 
Designer Vladimir Livkov, after testing models, built L1, a two-seat air cushion motorboat. When his vessel successfully passed tests, at one of the lakes, Levkov was provided with a design bureau. In 1936, a new L5 motorboat was built. This 9-ton all-metal twin-hull boat reached a speed of 70 knots. For a motorboat of that time, it was simply fantastic. What seemed absolutely unreal for that time was that L5 could glide not only over water, but over the ground too. L5 tests went on in the Gulf of Finland. Even at C3 points, the vessel stood stable over the surface. Tests continued in winter, when the Gulf was frozen and ordinary vessels were anchored. Basically, such vessel could travel over any more or less plain surface, whether it was sand, swamp, water, ice, or snow. Such cross-country ability was very attractive. Aircraft designers experimented with the air cushion as well. In 1940, one of UT-2 airplanes was equipped with an air cushion landing gear. But those were only experiments. Vladimir Livkov dealt with the air cushion vessels until the war started. Tests in the sphere continued after the war as well. Although they did not reach wide scale, the country had a lot of other burning problems to resolve. The worldwide boom of the air cushion vessel's development occurred in the 60s. Several types of such machines were built abroad and the costs were supposed to be covered by their commercial use. Here is a vessel that needs no pier. This new ship made by British designers starts right from the shore. It moves on an air cushion created by powerful gas turbines. The vessel can carry 120 passengers and can reach a speed of 170 kilometers per hour. There was even a more gigantic project of a 700-seat vessel designated for carrying passengers over the British Channel. In the West, this new technology had both military and civil applications. In the Soviet Union, it was used by army in the first place. Appearance of the real combat means were preceded by test rig experiments. Future combat machines were tested to overcome minefields to be able to move at high wave under close to combat conditions. Finally, there appeared air cushion assault vessel. The main point of the future war scenario was that after nuclear attacks, the enemy's territory was supposed to be occupied by numerous assault forces. They, of course, needed means of delivery. Ordinary assault vessels had low speed, insufficient maneuverability, and could approach by no means all shores. Air cushion vessels were free from all those deficiencies. The topic enjoyed support from the military leadership of the USSR. A number of air cushion vessels of various payload were built. The Almaz Design Bureau from Leningrad was specializing on this kind of technique. The vessels were named accordingly, the Skate, the Squid, the Lobster. 
Such were the names of the assault motor boats designed in the Almaz Design Bureau. Combat characteristics were improving from one sample to another. The Gazelle vessel had a range of already 300 miles and speed of 50 knots. It could carry two tanks and 200 fully armed soldiers. The Navy obtained 18 machines of this project. The Buffalo became the top in the list. It was the world largest air cushion vessel. A full-size football field could serve as a parking for only four buffalo. This vessel could bring an assault force to an undeveloped shore and provide fire support. Of course, air cushion vessel. But let's get back into the 60s when various means of transport competed in the struggle for speed. Yes, air cushion vessels were superior than ordinary ships in speed. But they also had a limit. While the speed increase potential of the wing in ground machines was not yet exhausted. That is why Rostislav Alexeyev's design bureau was doing quite well. Tests of experimental samples provided a lot of experience. Alexeyev's success was much preconditioned by the fact that he did a lot of tests on various models first. In his arsenal, you would find radio-controlled models, models towed by motorboats and cars, catapulting and control line models. All this served the single task, improvement of the winging ground machine. The team was basically ready to perform a serious task. A governmental resolution issued in 1963 assigned the team to produce assault transport and missile wing in ground machines. Their dimensions were supposed to exceed all previous Alexeyev's projects. Therefore, the prototype sample had the same size as the future combat vessel. It was the KM winging ground machine. The giant was 100 meters long and had a wingspan of 38 meters. The fin was at the height of a seven-story building. Until the Maria heavy cargo airplane appeared in the end of the 80s, KM was the largest aircraft in the world. KM's peculiarity was that with the dimensions of a vessel, its performance was that of an aircraft. It was built by specialists of the Gorky aircraft plant. The bottom was made of the shipbuilding alloys, while the top was shaped of the aircraft metals. This winging ground machine had no match in the whole world and its construction was unique. The Gorky Reservoir was too small for tests, so KM was relocated to the Caspian Sea. By the way, KM meant simply a ship mock-up. But in the West it was called the Caspian Monster. It was easier to make taxpayers believe in the necessity of an antidote against such monsters. To be frank, the Caspian Monster perfectly matched its name. Impression grew when the monster started moving. The roar of ten jet engines with a thrust of ten tons each created fear and respect. Eight boosters were placed on the front pylon while two cruise engines were mounted on the fin. The crew of the first flight consisted of 31 people. Rostislav Alexeyev was at the wheel. There was an order in the ministry prohibiting top managers to pilot prototypes.
First, there were gliding flights, and then flights with the use of the wing in ground effect. After a series of tests, it became clear that the body's strength made according to the aircraft norms was insufficient. The body had to be reinforced, and it took a long time. But still, the machine proved to be phenomenal. It flew stable at a height of 4 meters with a speed of 400 kilometers per hour. Those who witnessed the flight were absolutely fascinated and proud. With a roar and sprays at start, the flight itself was calm and gallant. If the machine was lifting up, it was enough to reduce acceleration and the vessel would smoothly return to surface. It was the landing that was not at all smooth. It resembled a fast ride in a farm wagon over a cobbled pavement. In general, the KM tests showed that the wing in ground machines of such a size could fly, and fly excellent. However, due to the topic uniqueness, there were a lot of problems needed to be resolved. Therefore, together with KM, a number of minor flying stands were built. The SM-5 machine was a 1 to 4 scale model of the monster. It went on tests, but a year later there was a catastrophe. Having lifted off too high, the machine lost the wing in ground effect and crushed. It was the first heavy accident with the wing in ground machines. Though it did not stop the works. Instead of the lost machine, there appeared a new SM-8 sample. It was aimed at the KM testing methodology development. At the same time, SM-6 was used for the Arlionic winging ground assault vessel development. Arlionic was ordered by the Navy in 1968. The customer's special requirement was to improve the vessel's seaworthiness and amphibiousness. High sea and the striking impact over the body required to reinforce the bottom accordingly. A ski shock absorber was installed to reduce such impact. To let the vessel moving on ground, it was equipped with the wheel landing gear. Arlionic entered tests in 1972. It was smaller than the Caspian Monster, but its payload was 20 tons, which was equal to 200 fully armed soldiers. An assault force could be delivered within a range of 1,400 kilometers at a speed of 400 kilometers per hour. When the vessel was reaching the shore, grounding was performed through the tilting front side. Arlionic's boosters had variable angle nozzles. At the air feed, the jet flow would go under the wing. After liftoff, the flow would be directed above the wing, creating huge exhaustion and high lift. No special engines were made for the wing in ground machines. Instead, duly improved aircraft engines were used protected from sea salt, which was covering all elements and reducing efficiency. 
air intakes were specially designed to prevent water from getting into the booster engine. The cruise engine was put on top of the fin, high above the water surface. It was a super powerful NK-12 turboprop engine with coaxial propellers. It was normally used on strategic bombers and heavy transport aircraft. But not only this made the winging ground machine similar to airplanes. It could fly going way beyond the wing in ground effect. So it was not just a wing in ground machine, but a wing in ground airplane. Since Arleonok was planned to be put on service, the problem of crew training emerged. It was not clear who will operate the vessel, sailors or pilots. The problem was resolved by Ivan Borzov, the naval aviation commander. After he was shown how the wing in ground machine said, it's a pure low altitude flight. The pilots will do it. Arleonok was the only Soviet military wing in ground machine put into production. The program enjoyed great support of the Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov. At first, the state program assumed construction of 100 machines. Then the number went down to 24. But even such plan was doomed to fail. A total of only five machines was built. They formed an air group directly subordinated to the headquarters of the naval aviation. The Soviet Navy flag was raised on the first combat wing in ground machine. The government also assigned Rostislav Alexeyev to build a missile winging ground machine. The new vessel was called the Lun. It was a unique missile carrying winging ground vessel. In fact, it served as a high speed launch pad for the Mosquito supersonic anti ship missiles. Missile containers were placed right on the vessel's back. The loon's weight of fire was similar to that of a missile cruiser, but it was ten times superior in speed. It was low observable and maneuverable. Besides, its construction cost was significantly lower than that of a cruiser. The vessel's dimensions allowed it to take off at seas of up to five points. The Loon's layout repeated that of the Caspian Monster, but was a bit smaller. It was floated out in 1987, and three years later, its trial operation started. Loon was tested as a rescue vessel. Its floating wing served this purpose best of all. The Loon's second copy was started but not finished due to the Soviet Union's collapse. Interesting enough, but only USSR had these exotic machines. In absence of any complete and reliable information of the Arleonik and Loon programs, Western specialists regarded the threat coming from the Tusum as very serious. For Europe in the first place. Indeed, it was very difficult to intercept such a fast vessel. Flying above the water surface, it was invisible for radars. Hydroacoustics could not hear it. Neither mines could stop it. while its range allowed to deliver an assault force to any European shore.
By that time, the Soviet military strength reached its maximum. It was a huge and well-equipped army, with thousands of aircraft of all types and purposes, hundreds of ships and powerful submarines, tanks and artillery units, wide-range missiles and nuclear weapons. Combat wing in ground machines made a good part of the military potential of this country. What was interesting, the better part of the population either way participated in the creation of this military might, but it knew nothing of the numerous and sometimes enormous project. The reason was the notorious secrecy. Here is an illustrative example. A brochure was published in 1983 called The Flying Ships. It was describing the air cushion ships and wing in ground vessels showing pictures of foreign samples. The brochure mentioned USSR having such vessels, but of minor size, made by students. Not a word of the Caspian monster Arlenok or Lund. A series of events in the beginning of the 80s produced a negative impact on the future of the wing in ground machines. Rostislav Alexeyev died in February 1980. The Caspian monster built in a single copy crashed the same year. The pilot operating it after a long interval made several fatal mistakes, which led to the catastrophe. Everyone who knew the vessel were confident that something supernatural had to be performed for the catastrophe to happen. However, it did happen. Several years thereafter, Defense Minister Dmitry Ustinov, the godfather of the wing in ground topic, died. The attitude toward the program and its funding changed to worse. In 1991, the country that gave birth to the unusual machines collapsed. In 1992, one of the Arlenoks crashed. A year later, the whole type of these vessels was removed from operations. Neglected in an instant, the remaining machines calmly lived their last years in the Caspese base. In summer 2007, one of them was towed to Moscow to join the Navy Museum at the Kimhi Reservoir. In the 90s, the Alexeyev Design Bureau, obtaining no state orders, started development of civil modifications. In the absence of funding, works were limited to models construction. The Bureau tested dummies of a gigantic ocean winging ground vessel for hundreds of passengers and huge cargo platforms. However, time for giants was gone. The main stake in the 90s was made on vessels of minor size, the Volga II winging ground boat and the Strij winging ground aircraft. Business trips, active tourism, fast speed passenger transportation, irrespective of whether the shipping season is open or not, all year round on water, ice or snow.
Pilots Triege was initially designed as a training winging ground machine to prepare crews for the large combat winging ground vessel. In 2000, the S-90 wing in-ground dummy made by the Suhoi Design Bureau was shown at the Gelenjik Hydro Aviation Show. The Ivolga wing in-ground aircraft was introduced in 2007 by designer Vyacheslav Kolganov. Ivolga was a multi-purpose machine designed for passenger transportation, patrolling, ecological control and excursions. Alexeyev's design bureau continued to develop wing and ground machines. One of them was Aquaglide. To market this machine in the West, it was taken to Bahamas. There, it was beyond competition among luxurious yachts with powerful motors. So many arguments seem to be in favor of the new type of transport with their cross-country ability to overcome the undeveloped road infrastructure. Machines were practically close to perfection, with so many versions offered for a wide range of purposes. But no use. In the minds of many, the wing and ground machines were strangers and therefore dangerous. Time is needed to break stereotypes. In fact, nothing is perfect and problems in operating such machines exist. For example, recently developed winging ground vessels are of minor dimensions. Therefore, they can be used mainly on lakes and rivers where there are a lot of birds. Speed as the main advantage of the wing in ground vessels is not at all obvious. It is too high for the winding rivers with a lot of motorboats, steamers and slow barges. In the recent times, interest toward wing in ground vessels occurs in the West. Americans, for example, far back in the 90s computed the possibility of building a huge vessel with a wingspan of 150 meters. This enormous project was considered by Boeing. The vessel was called Pelican. Its main purpose was fast delivery of troops and military equipment. So far, Americans have not been actively developing this project. On the other hand, South Korea has officially announced construction of a commercial winging ground vessel with a payload of 100 tons by 2012. In the beginning of the film, we put a question. What is a winging ground machine? A flying ship or an airplane that can sail? We should confess it is neither nor and although formally it is attributed to vessels and is subject to the laws of shipping, this means of transport which stands between two environments is absolutely unique. Bartini once proposed a theory of the worldwide intercontinental transport. He thought of a future flying machine that could have a speed of an airplane, payload of a ship, and ability to take off from anywhere. All described are features of a wing in ground vessel. We live in the times of communications. 
means of transport are tightly squeezed between the sky, the land and the sea. This means that soon the theory of Roberto Bartini, enriched by the practical experience of Rostislav Alexeyev, will be reclaimed, brought to life and appreciated.